This is Tech Talk Born episode 298. No air power for Airbnb to see me. E. Welcome to Tech Talk with Buona. This technology podcast covers tech news and reviews for the entire week. And now here's your host, me, Buona McCall. Greetings, folks, and welcome to episode 298 of Tech Talk with Buona. We got a great show lined up for you. I got a lot of stories, man. Woo-wee! Wow, I went high pitch on you. Yeah, I got a lot of stories. I had to cut back on a couple of them. Uh, lots of stuff with Facebook, man. Zuckerberg went nuts, but I I kind of ignored that stuff. Um, but <laughs> he's like he's like going b- before the government talking about uh, I we're gonna we need to work with the government for regu- more regulation. I'm like I don't know what Zuckerberg's up to, so we're gonna give Facebook a break this week. I've been in Facebook heavy on the news the past couple couple episodes, so we're gonna let you guys explore those Facebook articles yourself, and we're gonna talk about other things. Uh, we're going to be exploring some stuff with the mobile devices and mobile phones, so that's going to be cool. Uh, also, some stuff about Airbnb. I've never talked about Airbnb on this show, so that's going to be interesting. Great show lined up for Tech Talk of One episode, 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 episode 298, 298, 298. And for our first story, we're going to talk about Article 13, Article 13, Article 13. This has been in the news for quite some time. Article 13 is a new, uh, I I don't want to use the wrong words. It's a new recommendation. I think that's what they're calling it. It's, it's not law, right? It's, it's not, it's not a law yet, but it's like a guidance for, uh, for, for the countries in the EU to create laws from, I think that's the best way to describe it. And it is for copyright reform, and it's a very, very drastic, somewhat harsh bill that uh, I don't, don't want to call it a bill. It's, a, it's, it's, it's some recommendations to essentially put the put the onus of all copyright problems on the, the platforms. So essentially, what they're saying, and I'm going to watch how many times I say essentially. That's what for. What they're saying is companies like Google. Companies like like Twitch, Facebook, whoever, they need to put filters on their sites to prevent you from posting copyright stuff in the beginning. Right now, there's a safe harbor law that uh, companies like Google and Facebook and Twitch and all these other people, YouTube, safe harbor law, meaning that they're not liable for copyright inf- infractions. Uh, and DMCA laws allow companies to take down the content after the fact, but YouTube and Twitch and Facebook and other places, Twitter are not liable for that, for that content. This new guidance and the subsequent laws that would come from it would essentially allow them, uh, there's another essentially, would allow them to, uh, to blame the company or find the company if they don't prevent that content from being posted in the first place, there's also some stuff in here about links they call the link tax where you'd have to purchase a license in order to quote a link or to post a snippet of another article somewhere else. Well, that's something I do on this podcast all the time. So article 13 made a big, big, uh, it made big waves over the internet, Google in the form of YouTube, Twitch, and a lot of people put, forth a lot of campaign efforts and try to get us to tell you guys about it and it's been going on for a while i was i was very i was fairly silent about it on this channel but we talked about it quite often on my live stream at twitch.tv slash buona so this particular guidance uh what was what was going on for the past last week was that they were trying to implement some some addendums uh in order to make this thing a little bit more friendlier and uh all of those (laughs) all of those amendments as they call them were denied all of them so all of the changes that we wanted to make to this to this guidance and recommendation for for article 13 and the link tax they were all denied and so as it stands in about two years uh this is going to be made official 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 and then 
com- uh, countries in the EU would have to make laws based on that to, to make this to implement this. It's not good. It's not a good way of approaching this. Uh, there are other ways of doing this, but this is a very heavy handed approach. It's, a lo- it's essentially putting a lot of responsibility on companies to predict what you're uploading. So we're going to have upload filters. You upload a video, they're going to have to scan it and try to guess if it's fair use or not, which is nearly impossible. Well, not even nearly. It is impossible to do that. So we don't know what's going to happen with this. Um, Lots of lots of EU individuals and and people on the Internet are looking at who is who who voted yes for this and who who didn't do that. And they're like, well, you're up for reelection, so we're not going to be letting you back in. Overall, this is a very bad thing uh, for people like me, for content providers, for uh, Twitch streamers, for YouTube uploaders, for people who post a lot of stuff on it, on just people who post stuff on the Internet. I think that's the best way to describe it. For people who post stuff on the Internet, this is bad because it's going to be a lot worse for you. Now, yes, this is an EU thing, but it will affect us in the United States and other countries as well. Don't think that it won't. A lot of people out there are screaming VPN, VPN, just use a VPN. That's not going to cut it. I'm going to tell you why. Because companies like YouTube and Twitch and Facebook and Twitter, whoever else who allows Instagram, they're their filters. Okay. Mind you, their filters are going to be worldwide. I'm calling it right now. They're going to be worldwide because any, any law that doesn't include the implementation of a VPN is kind of a silly law because the way it stands, I mean, you can bypass a lot of these laws just by going to a VPN and, and pretend you're coming from somewhere else. That's like, that's like going to rob a, rob a convenience store with a mask on and say, that wasn't me. You know, it's it's pretty foolish to think that a VPN is gonna gonna solve this. Plus, the amount of mil- the millions of dollars they're gonna implement in implementing something like this, they're gonna it's gonna be site wide. They're not gonna filter by country because everybody who wants to post something is going to VPN and bypass it. So they're not going to they're not gonna do that. Plus, it's going to affect laws created in other countries as well. This is gonna this is gonna filter out. Uh, this is gonna basically is going to fan out like a virus and affect everybody. Um, it's not good. It's not a good thing. And I, and I don't speak about politics very often, but when it affects what I do like this and it affects this show, I kind of do have to bring it up. Um, I don't know what is going to happen. Honestly, uh, there's a lot of people out there that say, Oh, there's no way they'll let this happen. Blah, blah, blah. And some of the worst things in the world have come across from that attitude. And you, don't <laughs> don't underestimate the power of human stupidity. Who was that? Einstein who said that? It is, it is, it is pretty vast. Um, but honestly, I can I understand the motivation behind this law. Don't don't get me wrong. I know copyright should be protected. I'm not I'm not naive enough to say oh everything should be for everybody everywhere and nobody should get paid for anything. You know, there's 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 some kind of checks and balances that need to be put in place. But this is unrealistic. It is too overbearing and it's not going to help. Uh, it's it's going to hurt things. It's actually going to hurt things. I think people are going to take drastic measures to to express themselves now. If you, if you take away their 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 means of doing it now. Overall, I don't know. <clears throat> I think uh I think Google and I think Twitch and I think all these other people realize that it's going to be a heavy monetary investment. It's going to it's going to hurt them, um, but it's also going to it's going to hurt us from posting. Because can you imagine? Let me let me just give you a, a scenario because some people can't see the the issue with it. Can you imagine you're uploading a video talking about your favorite TV show? I don't know, Family Guy or something. It could be Futurama, and. You, I don't know, you do an imitation of Peter Griffin and you say a line or you just, you know, you put a little, a little snippet of the show where they talk, they say something funny or, you know, in your own voice or you put like a, a, a little video clip of it without the audio. So Twitch or YouTube, whoever you upload that to, they see that and they go, man, that looks like, that looks like that family episode denied. You're like, well, I didn't put anything from the show. And then you try again and then you don't include any of the video footage. You just include your impersonation of Peter Griffin and 
their heuristics recognize it as actual Peter Griffin. Denied. And you try this over and over again, and you're going to get frustrated, and you're not going to want to do it over and over again. You're not going to want to upload this stuff. And it's going to hinder how you do things. So most people, some people will just give up and say, well, I'm not going to, I'm just not going to post it. But there's going to be people, people out there that's going to look for other ways. We mentioned VPN, but I don't think VPN is going to be a solution. I mean, are they going to run to the dark web? They're going to, it's, people are going to find ways to post their stuff. And it's going to be harder and harder to get to that and actually view it. So overall, it's going to hinder us. It's going to hurt the Internet. Uh, that's just one scenario, one, one case, one, one, one little scenario. And then you got a small company, say a competitor to YouTube. I'm not going to say Vimeo because Vimeo is pretty big. So you got a competitor to YouTube and they're trying to start up a business where you can upload, I don't know, artistic commentary about what you're drawing or what you're building. And they have to abide by these laws as well. Now, what art, you know that art can just cross over fair use in all kinds of ways. So somebody's drawing a picture of Dragon Ball Z, drawing a picture of Goku, and they're talking about it. With the Article 13, <laughs> they would have to, the company, the small company that's building the site would have to implement the same filters that YouTube would. Do they have the means to do that? I don't know. But in the same light, they're going to have to predict what you're uploading before you upload it or they're going to be fined heavily fined enough to go out of business so it, it's not good for the consumer it's not good for the, the small businesses and it's not good for the big businesses either especially if you use them overall it's just article 13 is just it's just bad there's nothing good about it check the story out guys i got the link over to dw.com it's all over the web this thing recently passed and a lot of people are concerned and rightfully so Article 13 is Article 13 is very very bad. And I think it's been renamed. I haven't got the new name for it, but we'll be we'll be we'll be monitoring that. Check it out guys. Let me know what you think. And for our next story, we're going to talk about robocallers. Oh my goodness. Massive groan and sigh. Robocallers, these are these annoying automated calls that you get, especially if you're in the US. I don't know if you guys overseas get these. Uh you get these these ads and these scams and these basically spam. In the form of a call, you get them on your mobile devices, you get them on your phones, you get texts, you get landline calls. They just find you no matter where they are. Well, the FTC and the FCC have been trying to crack down these guys for quite some time. And uh, the FCC is the one I want to talk about in this story. This story comes by way of Ars Technica. Now, some stories have come out that the FTC shut down some major, major robocalling shops and uh, they've, they've been receiving praise for it. Uh, they collected, uh, according to this article, that they, they shut down a whole bunch of guys. They collected $120 million uh, in fines, and they shut down people completely. But this article goes on to say that the FCC, and again, this is the FTC versus the FCC, they fined people $200 million since 2015. So they fined a lot of people, but they've only collected $6,790. You, yeah, yeah, yeah. $6,000 they've collected from 208 million fines. Wow. The Federal Communications Commission has issued $208.4 million in fines against robocallers since 2015, but the commission has collected only 6790 of that amount. That's because, according to the article, that's because the FCC lacks authority to enforce penalties. The Wall Street Journal learned of the 6,790 figure by making a Freedom of Information Act request. Interesting. An FCC spokesman said this agency lacks the authority to enforce the forfeiture orders it issues and has passed all unpaid penalties to the Justice Department, which has the power to collect the fines. Many of the spoofers and robocallers and ag the agency tries to punish are individuals and small operations the spokesman added, which means they are at times unable to pay full penalties. Well, boo who? Boo freaking who? Welcome to America where you're not able to pay what you owe. Seriously. Oh my goodness. This, this kind of makes my blood boil a little bit because robocallers, they've been, they've been plaguing us for years. They've been plaguing a lot of us for years. It's not a legit business practice. It's a scam. It's not legit. And uh, they essentially force you to not even want to answer your phone. 
because you know there's telemarketers and then there's robocallers and they just they just spam you with you, uh, you check your messages and then you got all these you got these half messages it's like and call bill at 1-800-333-489 and then it's just like what in the world was that because they don't they don't even they don't they're so cheap they don't even bother to wait for the for the beep some of them are smart enough to wait for the beep on your, your answer machine hi my name is solomon and i'm here to help you win money you want money don't you well come to our website it's, it's spam it is spam oh my gosh but anyway the ftc has been receiving praise because they shut down and i'm not gonna i'm not gonna link that in this story but it's kind of related they shut down some major robocalling sites so that's a win and it's going to cut down on a lot of uh it's going to cut down a lot of the robocalls and they've issued more They've collected more fines since I think this article says 2004. Yeah, they've collected 120 million out of 1.5 billion since 2004. That's still not a lot. Come on, man. They're proud of their 8% collection rate, but I'm not. I mean, if this was the IRS, these people would be in jail. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, here we go. Here, here's this. On Tuesday this week, the FTC announced court settlements with four separate operations. They actually talk about this in this article, so I don't have to link to the outside one. Four separate operations responsible for bombarding consumers nationwide with billions of unwanted and illegal robocalls pitching auto warranties, debt relief services, home security systems, fake charities, and Google search result services. Under these new settlements, the defendants are banned from robocalling most telemarketing activities, including using an automated dialer, and will pay significant financial judgments. They just keep it just, and it's a scam. It's basically business, it's just scamming business one on one. So, yeah, check this story out, guys. Over on Ars Technica, we got to hope that the FCC can do better. I'm hoping they can do better. We we gotta we gotta have some kind of faith and hope that they can do better than what they're doing. Six thousand seven hundred ninety dollars out of two hundred and eight million fines. This is a huge problem. This is a huge problem. Check it out. And for our next story, we're gonna talk about Apple. Apple has officially canceled their Air Power product. This story comes by way of MacRumors.com. I don't know if you guys remember this. Back in 2017, when the iPhone X or the iPhone 10 was announced. They announced this wireless charging peripheral. This thing was supposed to charge your Apple Watch, your iPhone, your AirPods, all at once, simply by placing them on a flat charging mat. But Apple has since backed down from this product and completely canceled it, which is not very common for Apple to do after they announce something. Apple has said, after much effort, this is their quote, We've concluded air power will not achieve our high standards and we have canceled the project. We apologize to those customers who were looking forward to this launch. We continue to believe that the future is wireless and are committed to push the wireless experience forward. This is from Dan Riccio, Apple, Apple's senior VP of hardware engineering that he uh, quoted was stating to TechCrunch. Again, uh, they said it would launch in 2018, but 2018 came and went, and there was no air power. A lot of a lot of the tech pundits and a lot of the, uh, especially a lot of the Android naysay or not the Android naysayers, but the Android people who who like to poke fun at Apple fans and like, where's air power? You know? <laughs> it was always like a running joke, and even people who like Apple were were joking about where's air power. Um, but I think the the general the general public have forgotten about it. Um, I really don't think people were saying, man, Apple, geez, I've been looking forward to this wireless charging pad for many, many years. And uh, you guys have not provided it. Where is it? I think the general public forgot about it. Uh, but it's not good for Apple. I mean, that, that kind of, you lose some trust with them. You know, if they come to a, they do another event or they do another um uh, some sort of a reveal, you know, it's like, is this going to be another air power? Is this thing going to actually happen? Cause it's not, it's not good for any company to announce the release of a product and, you know, tout and boast about it and then say, well, we couldn't meet the quality standards a few years later. And I mean, they were, they went dark on it for a long time. Like the full, all of 2018 went by without a word. And here we are in March going on April of 2019. And then they finally 
they finally fess up and go, well, our bad. We couldn't do it. Not good. It's, it's not a good thing. But as a consumer, as someone who is not in the market for this device, I don't care that much. I don't care that much. But I can understand if somebody really was looking forward to it, that they purchase. There's somebody out there. You know there's somebody out there who purchased an Apple Watch, purchased an iPhone 10, and purchased AirPods with the sole intention with the sole intention of charging them all on the Apple Air Power. That's the reason why they bought them. You know there's somebody out there like that. It's not a lot of people, but I'm pretty sure there's somebody out there like that. Um, and, and now they are livid. That one person or 10 people or 20 people or 1,000 people, I don't know how many people did that. They're livid because they're not going to get their Air Power. Rip Air Power, may you rest in peace, even though you were never born. Everybody show them a little bit of... A little bit of, uh, I don't know, solemn remorse. I don't know what to say. Apple has officially canceled Air Power. Check it out over on MacRumors.com. They got the details. Goodbye, Air Power. You were never here to begin with. And for our next story, we're going to talk about Sony. Sony to slash their smartphone workforce by 50%. What? This comes by way of Nikkei.com. Sony to slash their smartphone, smartphone workforce. By 50% by 2020. According to the article, fierce 5G competition and poor sales are the cause. Holy man. But honestly, how many of how many of you out there have owned a Sony smartphone in the last couple of years or are planning to buy one in the future? I think uh, I think Huawei Huawei Huawei. You know, I got I got I got to figure out how to pronounce that company's name. Apple, Huawei, LG, Samsung, you know, these are the big names you hear about when you talk about smartphones. They're the, they're the leaders. I mean, there's there's people beneath them, um, but uh, even then, you know, even juggernauts like Nokia, you know, you don't see much of anymore. And, you know, Sony is another one that's been around for years, years in the smartphone industry. I remember the, uh, I think it was the T68i. Man, what was that? Let me see if that was it. It was like a tiny James Bond phone. Yes, that was the last Sony phone I owned. I just looked it up. It was the tiniest little. It was like, it was like a, a, a phone for ants. It was so, it was so, so tiny and so cool. I loved that phone. It had a really small uh, footprint, and I remember I used Bluetooth in my car with it, and it was like I felt like James Bond. But man, Sony doesn't feel like James Bond right now. 2000 they said the decision to scale back the smartphone workforce which could see up to 2000 of the total 4000 job cuts by march 2020 to reduce fixed costs in the business and also includes procurement reform wow my have the the the, the just had the mighty have fallen i don't know how long they're going to be going man like how, how long is something going to be sticking with the smartphone industry uh, should they should they shift off of that? Because Sony Electronics, honestly, man, they're not as big as they used to be. I mean, there was all the rave about Sony TVs and uh, you know Sony uh, stereos and stuff like that. And the shift has been made to where you know we're we're not really buying stereos anymore. We're just buying speakers. We're buying these these elaborate smart speaker systems, and then we're just streaming music to them. You know, from Spotify and from other music services. Amazon Music and and iTunes and you know Apple Apple Music, you know we're streaming music and Google Play. We're not buying Sony stereos anymore. So is the age of the Sony electronic coming to an end? Some may argue that it's probably already over. So Sony's got to adapt, and I think they realize that they they have to adapt and adjust um, to this industry uh, because you know these days most people know Sony from their PlayStation line. Um, you know, but when I was growing up, when I was tiny, you know, everybody was talking about Sony stereos and Sony Walkmans and Sony TVs, you know, physical electronic appliances. But now the most important electronic appliance, which is a smartphone these days, they're having to cut back half of their workforce. Check it out, guys. Nikkei.com has the details. Sony to slash their smartphone workforce by 50 percent by 2020. 
And for our next story, while we're talking about smartphones and apps and stuff like that, researchers, according to this article on Vice.com, researchers have found that the Google Play Store apps were actually government malware? Security researchers have found a new kind of government malware that was hiding in plain sight within apps on Android's Play Store, and they appear to have uncovered a case of lawful intercept gone wrong. Oh my gosh, this is just, are you kidding me? The spyware apps were discovered and studied in a joint investigation by researchers from Security Without Borders, a nonprofit that often investigates threats against dissidents and human rights defenders, said Motherboard, or and Motherboard. The researchers published a detailed technical report of their findings on Friday. We identified previously unknown spyware apps being successfully uploaded on Google Play Store multiple times over the course of over two years. These apps would remain available on the Play Store for months and would eventually be re-uploaded, the researchers wrote. Wow. (laughs) So, uh, uh, essentially, and there's another essentially, I did it. Oh, no. These were, they were crafted to be spyware. They were crafted to be spyware, but they were actually sanctioned by a government. Who's behind it? All the evidence collected by the Security Without Borders in this investigation indicates the malware was developed by eServe, spelled E-S-U-R-V, an Italian company based at the southern city of Catanzaro in the Calabria region. The first, <clears throat> the first hint that the authors of the malware were Italian came from two strings inside the malware code, Mundiza and Reno Gatsu. Gatsu I don't know what that means. It's a dialect, dialectical word from the southern region of Calabria that loosely translates to garbage. The real smoking gun is the command and control server used in several of the apps that sent data back to the malware operators. Man, they got, they got samples of the malware all over this article and everything. Um, so eServe, they, they, they appear to have an ongoing relationship with the Italian law enforcement, uh, though security without borders was unable to confirm whether the malicious apps were developed for government, for government customers. They won an Italian, Italian government state border tender for the development of a passive and active interception system back in 2017. Um, Motherboard filed a freedom of information request to obtain the tender. And uh, I don't think they they got it. It was rejected. The anti-drug police dictator, an agency within the state police which responded to the request, said it could not respond with the documents because the surveillance system was obtained via with special security measures. Huh. Huh. So the question remains, is this all legal or illegal? It's unknown, but this is this is troubling, man. This is troubling. Um, you know, all the time Apple and Google go against each other in various ways, and Apple always goes the security route and privacy route that they would not uh they would not purposely submit data to government uh unlawfully and stuff like that. Google says the same thing. Um uh, but Apple is, I think Apple is much more strict on their apps. Sometimes people would argue that they're too strict on what, what constitutes a valid app in the, in the iTunes app store, um, in their app store versus Google. Google's a lot more lenient. Uh, and sometimes they get, they get, Google gets a lot of, uh, they get, get a lot of blowback because they allow everything through, but at the same time, it reduces the security of the store when you do that. So this is interesting. This is very interesting that this, this particular thing kind of was a bust from the begin with uh, from this government agency, if it's all true. But Google's got to tighten up. That's why I want to talk about this article because I think the Google Play Store really needs to tighten up, especially now that more and more people are getting smartphones. I think the number is staggering. I don't have the exact number, but the amount of humans on planet Earth that have a smartphone is staggering. And uh, I think marketing agencies, I think companies know that. And they're, they're focusing efforts to get their information on your phone or get your information off your phone for their purposes. Check it out, guys. Over on Vice.com, they got the details. This particular thing talks about some malware 
that was found on the Google Play Store, but it was actually government malware, according to Vice.com. And for our next story, we're going to go over to ZDNet.com, where they talk about the LTE protocol having 36 new security flaws. A South Korean researcher used some fuzzing techniques to the LTE protocol to find 51 vulnerabilities, of which 36 were new. Wow, if you don't know what fuzzing is, it's basically you just toss garbage data at an app or, or at something to see what happens. That's a black box technique where you just send a bunch of malformed and invalid data to the app or to the device to see if you can crack something or get some kind of memory buffer overflow or something to get some kind of vulnerability. 51 were found. 51 vulnerabilities and 36 are new. Now, this is coming at a convenient time because there's a big push. I don't know why. But you guys are seeing it everywhere, right? For this 5G, it really pushing for 5G. And it doesn't, doesn't seem all that much better on paper. But for some reason, this improved 5G standard is being touted as, oh, it's not going to have these security vulnerabilities. Um, but it probably will. I mean, it's... it's, it's it, it, <sighs> I think already, I think the article even po points to some articles. Yeah, there's some security flaws in 5G as well. So, I mean, there's there's one spin on this that some people are taking. I'm not saying this article or the, even the people behind the uh, the security exploit are behind it. But a lot of people are taking the tact that, hey, 5G is going to fix all this. And I, I, I need to look into it a little bit more, but I just don't understand why there's such a big push for 5G on mobile. Um but anyway, back to this article. Uh, these people, the Korean agency, I think they're known as KAIST, K-A-I-S-T. Um, stands for Korean Advanced Institute of Science and Technology Constitution. Um, I don't know where the Constitution comes in. I, okay, KAIST Constitution. I guess that's what they call themselves. Uh they they put together this fuzzing technique and uh they have they've got a lot a lot of papers under the belt according to the article i'm reading through this there's, there's a lot of papers they have under the belt back in july october and they've got a lot of a lot of clout so this should be taken seriously um they discovered the sheer number of flaws by using fuzzing a code testing method that inputs a large quantity of random data into the application according to the article, and analyzes the output for abnormalities, which in turn gives developers a hint about the presence of possible bugs. It's been used for years. It's not nothing new. Yeah, I've heard of it before. Um, I mean, we've even used it in automated testing in some cases, uh, my, my past experience with automated testing. So according to the paper, uh, researchers built a semi-automated testing tool named LTE Fuzz, which they used to craft the malicious connections to the mobile network and then analyze the network's response. Now, here's the meat of the article um i passed it they found that they could disrupt the mobile base stations block incoming calls to a device disconnect users from a mobile network and send spoofed sms messages and eavesdrop and manipulate user data traffic pretty much every worst case scenario you can think of regarding your mobile device and calls and data and sms um it's just pretty awful. It's pretty bad. So don't, uh, when you use your phone, you know, just keep in mind that somebody could be listening and probably is listening because if, if, if there's some interest to get your information, somebody's going to be able to do it. I mean, this is published stuff. You have to really think about all the things that aren't published. I'm not trying to make you paranoid or anything. Just be security conscious. That's all I'm saying. Don't call somebody and tell them your PIN number. You know, <laughs> you know, don't text your wife your password to, you know, your banking site, you know, that kind of stuff, you know, don't, don't do that. Um, because there is people, there are people listening to that kind of stuff. And if they wanted to get that data, they could. So you have to be really mindful of that. 4g and LTE has vulnerabilities and you can expect 5g that's coming along as well to have the same type. Check it out guys over on ZDNet.com. They got the details, 30 suit, 36 new security flaws, 51 vo found overall, man, the other ones, how come they haven't fixed those yet? And for our final story, we're going to talk about Airbnb. Now, when I first heard about Airbnb years ago, I was like, oh, okay. It's uh, it's kind of a paid, uh, controlled couch, sleep on my couch service type thing. And then as years went by, I learned that it was like elaborate 
elaborate things that people did to turn their homes or properties into little mini hotel rooms. Uh, and it's been very popular. It's been making a lot of inroads into the hotel market. A lot of people saying Airbnb is a lot more popular and making more money overall than some big hotel chains out there. But I also thought about this. You don't know who you're sleeping with, per se. You know, you go into somebody's house, they're, they're essentially a stranger, and you're trusting them with your safety and livelihood. Um, right. This article over on Atlantic.com talks about Airbnb and a certain someone having hidden cameras and recording their guests. And it's entitled, Airbnb has a hidden camera problem talks about this guy named max vest and uh, he stayed at a miami based airbnb and he found out that there were two small black rectangular rectangular boxes that were stacked next to an outlet on the far side of the guest room both facing the bed and they looked like phone chargers but when he got closer he realized they were cameras and they were recording he quickly got dressed grabbed his belongings and pocket pocketed the cameras and the memory cards as evidence. And then panic set in. It's almost midnight. He was alone in the home of someone whose name he didn't even know, apparently being recorded. What's more, his host could have been watching as he discovered the cameras. He said, I didn't know if I was being watched live. What I've found is since is that the cameras record to a memory card. They can also stream live. The host could have been watching. Anybody could have been watching. So that's uh, that's pretty messed up. So the company refunded his money, paid for the hotel room for the night, and eventually removed the host from the site. Now, let me let me just tell you something about my generation. You know, I don't know what we're called. I don't know what the label is. But the idea of sleeping with a stranger, right? Just 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 taking your bags, going to somebody somebody you've never met, and just just staying there was against the notion of common sense. You just don't do that. I mean, you're taught as a child not to talk to strangers, number one. That's embedded in your head. Number two, don't sleep at a stranger's house for whatever reason. You know, you, you, you trust hotels a little bit more because they have standards. They have regulations. They can get in trouble. There's some repercussions. But uh, Airbnb, just it just set, when I first heard about it, it just set off all kinds of alarms in my head that I just would not want to do that unless I absolutely had to. Now, Southern hospitality is another thing. So, if, you know, you're stranded and, you know, your car broke down and somebody walks up to your house, you know, you, you put up your guards and you say, hey, you, know, you come in for some tea or whatever, come in, have a seat. You know, Southern hospitality kicks in. But at the same time, that person can be a mass murderer. You're not going to invite them in to sleep over. You know, at the most, you might allow them to call a taxi to get out of there or, or to use your phone. Even then, some predators use that. But still, I just don't get Airbnb. I'm just that my generation, guys, uh, people my age, you guys in your 40s probably do get it. I don't know. I'm, I'm Maybe I'm in the minority. But if I'm going to stay somewhere, it's going to be at a hotel. And it's going to be a hotel I trust. And I say that before. I, I get the willies even when I stay at a hotel I've never stayed at before. Like if I go to a chain or something in an area that, you know, could be bad for whatever reason. Um, I get nervous. I, I get I get hard down nervous. You know, uh, I'm worried about the safety of my family, my wife, whoever's with me. Um, and, you know, I'm in I'm in protection mode. But Airbnb, man, I, I don't get it. You guys who travel a lot, who use it, maybe you trust all these people. You know, you rely on social reviews, which if if you've been on the Internet long enough, know these things can be manipulated. <laughs> Yelp and, and just Google reviews and Amazon reviews. If, if you've been on the Internet for a couple seconds, you know that those things aren't tr trustworthy. But this Airbnb got positive reviews and he said that he was nice and and Joe S. from Montana said it was the best night of his life. He's never, you know, people, you can't believe all that stuff. Anyway, this just points to just something I had suspected could possibly happen. I'm not saying that it is very common or it's running rampant. It's just one of those possibilities that what if you got some sick voyeur person who's recording you go to the bathroom or recording you sleeping and uploading it to some dark web fetish site or something you know 
these are the thoughts that go through my head when I when I when I'm in a stranger's house. They could be doing that. And it's not too far fetched. You can call me paranoid, you can call me whatever, but like I said, in my day, it was just pretty much common sense that you go into a stranger's house, you gotta you gotta hope for the best and you know, hope and expect that something could possibly go wrong. You hope for the best and expect the worst. Um Hidden cameras, guys. <laughs> so are you using Airbnb if you are? I mean, this is is this something that you you think about? Because according to the article, they said this just wasn't a negative experience. This was a criminal act. And I agree. I mean, your your privacy has been violated. But you know, there's people out there that says, well, if you don't have anything to hide, why do you care about privacy? Well, just let people record you while you sleep. You got nothing to hide, right? You're just snoring. Got nothing to hide. Let them record you, right? That that's what the, the people who don't think we need privacy say. <laughs> According to the article or the email, he says customer service representative, customers, customer service representatives for AB twice cited against them before reversing their original decision, and it was only after this blog post was shared wide online. Uh, this is another person, Bigum. He discovered some cameras in the rental. That they were never disclosed. He says, no one really needs, no one seems to know what they're doing, and it seems to only be getting worse. This article has multiple cases of people finding cameras in their house. In the house. Be careful, everybody. Check it out. Over on Atlanta.com. They got the details. Airbnb. People got hidden cameras in their house for whatever reason. Is it whether it be security or not? It should be publicly disclo- or disclosed somewhere. Let you know you're being recorded. So that you can be, you know, aware of that. Check it out. And that concludes episode 298 of Tech Talk with Born and Wild. We're coming up on 300. I ain't doing nothing special for 300. Don't ask. Shut up. <laughs> follow me on Twitter, guys. Twitter.com slash one. You can follow my live stream at twitch.tv slash Buona. Also, I'm on Instagram.com slash Buona. YouTube.com slash Buona. Find me everywhere, chat. I called you chat. I, I went the whole episode without calling you chat. And my live streaming stuff has slipped in again to the podcast. You're not chat. You're just my audience. It's a sad thing. We got merchandise. Yes, we're over on shop.spreadshirt.com. I think that's it. I'll put the link in the show notes just to be sure. But I think it's uh, spreadshirt.com. Let me get the link here. It is shop.spreadshirt.com slash Buona TV. We got some merchandise. You can get the Buona face logo. We have our Buona OK emo from Twitch on there, as well as we got some Elite Dangerous based stuff with Snoop Boot Polish mugs and t shirts. Uh, we're going to be adding some more things as well over the next coming days. So I'm going to be putting that, promoting that so you guys can support me and get some cool coffee mugs in the process over on Spreadshirt. Dot com. Thank you so much for listening to the show. We're going to be recording these on Sunday now. You may have noticed that it wasn't recorded on Friday. Uh, I'm going to be recording my podcast on my days off of streaming from now on. I'm not going to do the thing I did with Friday morning. Uh, I decided to go a different route. And we're going to be you know, changing things around now. I'll keep you guys abreast of when that happens. So we'll be recording Tech Talk of Buona on Sundays and Game Chat of Buona on Wednesdays. I think I've had this scheduled before, so you should be used to it if you've been following the podcast. So thank you so much for listening and I'll see you all. See you all next time. Have a great week. And uh, this is going to be released around April Fool's. But all these stories are legit. I don't do the April Fool's fake news stuff. So thank you so much for listening and I'll see you all next time.